Okay, Dan, I'm asking you a couple questions now. All right, son, what you want to ask me? Where do babies come from? <laughs> babies come from a pelican. When me and your mother wanted you, we had to deliver a letter to the pelican with a $50 money order, and they delivered you nine months later. Do you know we got internet, right? I know we got internet, but if you look on the internet and it doesn't tell you that you came from a pelican, it's bullshit. Let's take this time to thank our sponsors for Everyday Talk. Ohio runs boxing. We appreciate your sponsorship, your monthly subscription sponsorship. And also, Kevin Uretia, we appreciate you as well for your monthly subscription sponsorship. If you guys want to become a sponsor, click the support button and become a sponsor today. You are now tuned in to the hottest podcast in the world with your host, Lamar Champ Maker Wright. Welcome back to Everyday Talk. I am your host, Lamar Champ Maker Wright. Listen, Friday night was a big night of boxing. If you guys miss it, if you guys missed it, you need to stay tuned to this podcast so I can give you the fight recap on both fights that happened on Showtime and on The Zone. We're going to be starting the recap, the fight recaps with Showbox first. In the first fight on Showbox, it was Derek Coleman, 11 and 0 with 8 knockouts. They said Derek Coleman is from Detroit. I'm from Toledo. Really didn't know too much about the kid. This was actually my first time seeing this kid. Um, so I don't know if it was because I've been out of the amateurs for six years. He might have been doing his thing uh, since then. I really don't know the kid. Never seen him. But he was going to. I was rooting for him, though, because he's from Detroit. I always root for the Detroit fighters because we're so close to him. 35 minutes, 40 minutes away from Detroit. He was going against uh, Joseph Jackson, another undefeated kid. Uh, he's not a kid, he's a grown man, 30, year, 30, 30 years old, from North Carolina, 15-0 and 0 with 12 knockouts. Now, if you guys, all the boxing people know, North Carolina has uh, these guys that build their records and uh, guys from, you know, from fighting states use those type of guys to build their fighters' records and build the confidence of their fighter. Um, so I thought he was going to be that type of guy. I can't even lie. I thought Jackson was going to be that type of guy coming from North Carolina. Um, to me, it was a – just comparing the records, I said, well, you know, this is a step-up fight for both of them because really both of them had faced a limited opposition. Uh, but if I had to pick who had the better resume out of their opposition – I would have to say Jackson fought the tougher op the tougher opposition. Uh, not by much, though. Not by much at all. Let me. Uh, he just won by a um, <laughs> a squeak. He just won by a squeak of having the tougher competition. Uh, Coleman was never past five rounds. Um, he was in tonight in his first eight round fight, and Jackson has been. 10 rounds one time, so that gives him the edge on the experience. But let me tell you, man, Jackson came out hot in the first round, pressing behind the jab and working the body of Coleman. Um, Coleman did come back in the in the later of the round uh, with some heavy shots uh, landed on Jackson to let Jackson know, yo, I'm here. Uh, I'm a young, hungry dude. I'm a big, stronger dude, and I'm here. You're not just going to get... You're not just going to get those uh, those big shots off on me and think it was all okay. Um, and another fun fact that I didn't know was, like I said, I never knew Jackson, never heard of him, never heard of Derek Coleman. But Jackson was a sparring partner for Tony Harrison to help get him ready for Charlo. So to me, that gives Jackson another edge because he's sparring the world champion. You know, for that many rounds, he's learning. And, um, you know, picking up his ring IQ as long as he, you know, being a sparring partner for Tony Harrison. But Coleman did look strong, man. He started to come forward with strong one-twos. Um, he started working the body. He was back, backing Jackson up. Um, Jackson was looking to box and try to work out of that mid-range. Um, 
had a nice double uh, left hook uh, going good, you know, going good for him at that time. But Coleman was really coming on. If you see Coleman, man, he's got a built like a tank, you know, muscle bound guy, young dude. Uh, he is talented as well. But it was back and forth action going on. In the fourth round, Jackson really put a put on a boxing clinic. Uh, he started moving laterally, started confusing Coleman. Coleman just followed him around and allowed Jackson to stop and pop and hit him with good combinations. This is why you don't you got to learn how to cut the ring down. You can't follow these guys who got this uh, or who has. Uh, the capability of using good lateral movement. You got to cut that down. Cut the cut the ring down. Make it small. Don't follow these guys because they can stop on a dime just like Jackson was doing and pop combinations and get out of there. The fifth round was more the same. Jackson boxing. Coleman just following and following. Uh, but Jackson started to find counter shots in that round. To me, that was the turnaround point in that fight uh, when he started finding counter big counter shots. Um, at the end of five, I had it 3-2 Jackson. And then in the sixth, Jackson dominated Coleman uh, with combinations, um, you know, with boxing and combinations. Then he hit Coleman with a combination that really sent him off balance and fell into the ropes. And I think the ropes kind of held him up. It could have been counted as a knockdown, but it wasn't. Uh, Jackson at that point started coming forward, landing heavy body shots. Uh, Jackson turned into the bully. He went from boxer to bully after Coleman was like wore down. He went to boxer to bully. Uh, Coleman was clearly fatigued. Jackson capitalized. And North Carolina, you might have your first legit prospect in a long time. I had the fight 6-2 Jackson. Judges seen it the same. One judge had it a shutout for Jackson. Jackson wins by unanimous decision in an upset win. He was the underdog in that fight. The second fight on uh, Showtime, Showbox, uh, had a bout between Montana Love, who was 12-0, with one draw, six knockouts, his only draw coming to Kenneth Sims, versus another undefeated fighter, Jericho Walton, uh, 16-0, seven knockouts. Uh, but, man, we got to talk about Love's outfit, man. This man was decked out for Valentine's Day, had all type of spikes uh, going uh, from his, I mean, the, the man looked good, man. Looked good. One of the slickest outfits that I've seen on a on a fighter in a long time, especially being just on Showbox. And uh, if you guys don't know who Love is, man, very, very, very uh, has all the charisma. Has all the charisma in a fighter. Uh, my man was decked out though. Um, sharp looking outfit. Uh, look good. Fight good. That's an old boxing saying. Look good, fight good. And in the opening round, Love was looking like his outfit. He was looking like his outfit. The boy was sharp, razor sharp. Um, had Walton, um, Walton froze uh, from his speed. Walton looked like he was confused. Um, I think he really underestimated the speed of Love. But um, I don't know if he did or not because, you know, he his sparring partner for this fight was the Southpaw uh, Foster. Foster is, you know, he's speedy, but he may not be as sharp uh, timing-wise as Love. And I think that's what had Walton just confused. Um, in the second round, uh, the action heated up. Love dropped Walton with a fast, sharp right hook off a touch left hand. He put a touch left hand on him, like blinded him and just whipped a, a right hook. Um, Walton was in trouble. Um, you know, he was in trouble from the beginning of the fight with Love Speed. Couldn't catch on to it. So in the second round, Love scores a, a knockdown. Uh, after Walton got knocked down, um, you know, he goes back to his corner. Ronnie Shields is his trainer. Uh, you know, legendary trainer in Ronnie Shields. He got in this fighter's ass, man, telling him, look, dude, you just waiting too long, man. You got to make this a fucking dog fight. You got to make this fight ugly. You got to press him. You can't let that dude look like his outfit. You can't let him be pretty. You got to press this fight, man. You got to make it a fight. And the third round, Walton came out. Walton came out and did just that. Uh, press Love landed a big overhand right uh, to start the third. And, and towards the end, landed a big left hook that shook Love. Love was physically shooken. You could see it. 
Um, in the fourth, Warden Kane uh, caught Love jumping in with a counter left hook and a straight right, uh, straight right that buckled Love. He buckled him. Legs was on. Uh, you know, he did the stanky leg after he got hit with that combina- combination jumping in. Um, Love was, con- yeah, he, he was definitely unsteady. Uh, Love did the right thing. He held on. He did the veteran move. He held on. Um, you know, and and Walton couldn't really get him off of the, uh, off of him. Love smothered the attack to go ahead and survive the round. In the fifth round, the fight started to become competitive with Walton pressing and Love trying to box. Love uh, was looking to box, catching with counters, catching Walton come in, uh, hitting him with feints. Um, after nothing but holding and hitting. Uh, in the six by both guys, Love hit Walton, Walton with a vicious double right hook uh, that he started to the body and finished to the head. Um, and Walton was almost out. Like he was, I mean, that was a devastating shot. He was almost out. Walton then started to smother Love, and Love did what the veteran um, does um, on the inside. Love started like. You know, he was putting his head under the chin of Walton, trying to get separation to work. Um, The eighth round was pretty much the same as the sixth, holding and hitting. I gave Walton three rounds out of eight. Love looked sharp in the beginning of the fight, Uh, showed he could fight on the inside, most importantly, and he showed flashes of power. You know, Love is not known as that big power puncher, but he definitely showed flashes of power. You guys keep it locked in here. We'll be right back to finish off the Showtime recap, and then we'll be headed over to the DAZN fights and recap those as well. Keep it locked in. We'll be right back. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome back. We're going we're gonna to jump right back into it with the fight recaps of Showtime, Showbox. The third fight of the night was Reese Aline, 15-0 with nine knockouts versus the veteran Adam Lopez, 19 wins, three losses, two draws with nine knockouts. I know Reese Aline, you know, we, we sparred. He sparred, come down here, sparred with a couple of my guys. Uh, very... Very nice young man, very talented. Uh, but it was a fight, you know, this was a step up for Reese Aileen. In his debut on Showbox, really his TV debut, period. Um, at the start of the fight, Adam Lopez tried to use his range. Adam Lopez is a real big 122-pounder, and he's, and he's tall for that weight class. Uh, so, you know, he tried to use his range. Aileen came forward. Uh, throwing and touching, uh, throwing and touching Lopez with fast combinations. Aline was throwing himself off balance just a little bit because of his eagerness to get to Lopez, and I can understand uh, all the jittery nerves on his first TV debut. But he he cleaned it up in the second round, man. The second round it was all Aline. You know, Aline was kept continuously throwing them combinations from everywhere, changing his angles. And just whooping Lopez's ass. There's no other way to explain it. I mean, he had awkward combination punching. He was here punching. He was there punching. He was to Lopez. I guarantee it felt like everywhere punching. Uh, Lopez was cut on the top left side of his head from a headbutt. uh, Accidental headbutt that happened uh, when it got close into a clinch. Round three. The ass whooping continues for Lopez. He had no answer for Aline. Aline just looked, um, Lopez just looked lost and couldn't stop Aline's uh, combination. Aline was throwing a combination of a straight jab, straight right hand, straight jab, 
And it was just catching uh, Lopez, man. Lopez, uh, it might be time for him to go ahead and hang it up. You know, he, um, uh, Aileen was just way too fast, man, and he was just everywhere with it, man. Not like in a bad way, but he'll be in front of him, on the side of him, on the left of him, and then back up the middle on him. Uh, Aileen looked like a monster, man, with his speed and combinations. Uh and combination punching, he stopped Lopez in the first minute um, in the half of the fourth round. Man, beautiful TV debut for Aileen. Got to give this kid all the credit. I mean, the way he looked, <laughs> you know, looked like he ready to go ahead and really, really step it up. Aileen, like I said, man, beautiful. Look, look like a monster in his TV debut. If you have a TV debut on Showbox, Showtime, or any other national TV, that's the way you want to look. You want to be able to take a veteran out like that in that type of fashion so people can talk about you. You guys better keep your eye on Reese Aleem. Um, very talented. I think he won a couple national Golden Gloves as an amateur. So, you know, he, he does have amateur experience. And, you know, he just looked like a monster tonight. Congratulations on your great performance on taking out a strong, tough veteran that easily. And the main event of Showtime, Showbox, was Thomas Matisse, 15-1 with one draw with 11 knockouts versus Isaac Cruz, 18-1. Uh, 18-1-1 with 14 KOs. Right off the back, man, you can when that fight started, you can see the height and reach discrepancy going to Matisse. Matisse like five nine. Um, homeboy uh, Cruz only five four. Man, little stubby T Rex arms. So Matisse had the height and reach. Uh, Cruz is you know he's a little short dude, man, but he comes to fight. My man is bringing a fight first round. Mat Matisse tried to box, but he couldn't keep the busy dude off of him, the busy little pit bull off of him. Matisse let Cruz inside. Uh, Matisse would, like, shell up and put his earmuffs on and let Cruz pound his body. I mean, this dude was throwing body shots on both sides, so he really trapped the escape of, of Matisse. But Matisse really just allowed him to get in there like that, like without any repercussion. Uh, you know, when when the pressure came real hard, Matisse would just put the ear muscle on and let this dude bang on the side of his body. Uh, and what can I say about uh, Cruz, man? Isaac Cruz is just a little pit bull. He started to remind me of Mike Tyson, man, because he had his gloves up to his lips and all you could do was, you know, all you seen was his eyebrows and his eyes just staring down just kept walking and walking and working the body as he walked Matisse down he worked the body he worked the body he was putting water in the basement man he was he was definitely doing that Matisse was moving straight back instead of moving side to side and that's how Cruz was able to keep getting to his body the way he was in the beginning of the rounds um, round three more of the same Cruz coming forward, ripping hard body shots on both sides, pushing Matisse back. Uh, but then later in that round, Matisse caught Cruz with a counter shot that hurt Cruz. Cruz stopped coming forward and started going straight back. Matisse identified that. He seen that he hurt him with something. Matisse started to walk him down um, towards the end of the round. Cruz was kind of lucky that happened towards the end of the round. He was able to, you know, he was able to catch his, you know, his, his, his butterflies back. He was able to gather his thoughts again. But uh, his corner did tell him, man, we told you to stop popping up in front of him. Don't let him measure you. But Matisse caught him with a great counter shot that stopped his forward progress. In the fourth round, it seems it seemed like in the fourth round, Matisse figured out what he should have been doing. He started using the jab well, moving side to side, catching Cruz on the way in. Cruz could not handle the lateral movement of Matisse. But I don't know if Matisse let him already do enough damage to his body 
in those three rounds because that little dude, the little they, and his nickname is the Pit Bull, and I see why they call him the Pit Bull. But he was ripping that body hard for them first three rounds, um, and then going into like the seventh round, Cruz with his relentless pressure, relentless pressure, hit Matisse with a big left hand that hurt Matisse bad. Matisse was holding, trying to recover, and at the end of the round, Cruz caught Matisse with an overhand right that hurt him badly at the end of the round. Thank the boxing guys for that, that that came at the end of the round as well because he was able to get back to his corner and gather himself in his corner. Cruz was looking like the stronger of the two in the later rounds because of all the body work that he had put in. Um... At the, uh, uh, hold on, and you know, because of all the body work that he put in, hold on, I lost my train of thought for that. Um, But that was, you know, the, the rounds got later, so that was the first time that both fighters had went eight rounds. So both of them were probably very fatigued, and anytime you make it out of a round that you've never, I mean, anytime you make it into a round that you've never been in, You've always questioned yourself, and fighters always seem to hold a little back because they just don't know if they can really push forward to all 10 rounds. So you catch fighters reserving in rounds they've never been in before. Uh, in a t- but in the 10th, listen, Matisse showed why you can never count him out. Matisse is probably one of the only fighters that's ever been losing a fight, multiple fights, and come back and knock you out. He's known for that. Matisse has done it several times on Showbox. But he, he showed in the 10th why you don't count him out. Um, he started he started banging Cruz up, man, with nice right hands and, and body work. Big 10th round for Matisse. In the end, though, Matisse would drop the decision by split decision, by, by split decision to the Pitbull Cruz in a hard-fought bout. It was a uh, great fight, man, but I recommend that um, Matisse, you know, he, he's fought a lot of tough fights, man, back to back to back to back. And um, he's got two losses, and they're not, they, them two losses didn't come to any scrubs or anything. But it's time to dial it back a little bit, man. Let him rebuild. Let him um, get some tune-up fights, man, then let him go, go back into it. I wouldn't recommend Matisse going right back into these tough fights, man, because this, yet again, was another tough, close fight that he endured, man. The kid got a lot of heart. I like Matisse, and Matisse can be a problem for a lot of these 135-pounders because he's very, he's a very underestimated puncher, and, you know, he really does got bricks in his hands, but tonight, this little pit bull, man, was, that's what he was. He's a pit bull, man. He stayed on it. Um, he, he stayed his... You know, he stayed his his, his his game plan. He seen his game plan out. And that was to work the body and try to hurt him late. So that's what I recommend for Matisse, though, man. He doesn't need to go back into another tough fight like that. Tone it back a little bit. Get him a few easy fights, a few easy wins, and then go back to it. Then, um, so you guys keep it tuned in, man. That finishes off the fight uh, recap for Showbox Showtime. We'll be right back. We're going to recap these fights on The Zone. If you did not watch these fights on the fights on The Zone, make sure you come back because you do not want to miss these recaps. Welcome back. We are going on to the recap of the fights that were on the zone. Some very entertaining fights. If you guys missed it, we will recap those. There's only one fight that I did not see that I cannot recap for you, and that is the Brad Solomon fight uh, because I switched over to Showtime, Showbox to watch those fights. Um, in the first fight on the TV portion of the zone. Uh, it was Blair Cobbs versus Go- Cote. Um, listen, if you guys haven't seen Blair Cobbs, man, Google this dude. You know, this dude must have been the biggest WWE fan growing up as a kid, man. He 
He, you know, he comes out, he got his Ric Flair persona, everything about him says it screams WWE. Um, the, the man came out, you know, he had, he wore trunks, all white trunks with hearts on them. The man came out, his ring walk song was uh, Shawn Michaels' Heartbreak Kids song, man. The man walked out to a WWE song. He thinks he's Re- Ric Flair. He hit you with the woo, woo, with the Ric Flair, woo. So, man, you know, I guess that's the kind of charisma that boxing needs, man. So, but, you know, he's doing his thing, um, catching the attention of the boxing fans that make, you know, doing that type of stuff. They, Them, them fans want to see you fight. Um, fans usually love watching Blair Cobbs fight because, you know, he's always involved in action-packed fights and always finds his way on the canvas. Uh, because of his lack of defense, but he always found his way to come back. You know, like I said, he was 13 and 0. Um, found himself like the few times I watched him fight. You know, he's always hit the canvas and came back. But tonight, or you know, he he didn't he didn't impress. You know, he didn't he didn't impress. Um, he was just moving way too much. At times, he looked awkward for moving so much. He, you know, he just wasn't himself. You know, Blair Cobbs is a dude that comes to fight. Just moving way too much. He's just trying to change it up. Um, the crowd was booing. Uh, Cobbs quarter told him um, he was moving way too much, and he needed to step to Cote, hit the body. Cote was unable to catch Cobbs uh, with some big shots. It was just, a, man, it was just an ugly fight. You know, this is a dude that he should have never went to the, the, the distance with. Uh, Cote coming off like a four-year layoff, fighting at 147. He was like a 130-pounder, the way smaller guy of, of both of them. Um, in the ninth round, Cobbs lost a point for a low, a low blow, but Cote held his head down, so it shouldn't have been a, a lost point. Uh, boring, ugly fight. That's all I can say. Uh, Blair hurt. Blair hurt his stock in this fight. You know, um, he's not championship caliber. Um, I think he will be a feeder fighter for Golden Boys prospects or top contenders. Split decision win for Cobbs, with the crowd booing the decision as if they thought Cote should have won, and they could be right. Cote should have probably won that fight. I don't. You know, it's just I wasn't into the fight. It was just a boring, ugly fight. Cobbs definitely hurt his stock. Golden Boy definitely going to have him as a feeder fighter for his top, for their top prospects or contenders. Um, now there, here, here we go. So this card, we all know this card was set up. Uh, the Dazon card, Golden Boy's Dazon card, was set up to showcase Jorge Linares and Ryan Garcia to get them into a fight this year. Um, everybody thought and thanks, you know, Linares is washed up because he moved up to 140 um, and got and got blitzed when he moved up to 140. But he's back at 135, man. And in the first round, um, off this setup fight, that's what it is. It was a setup fight to showcase Linares and Garcia. Linares came out looking to establish his jab um, while applying foot pressure with uh, with Morales, doing the same but fighting at a distance. Morales was trying to really catch his distance and keep Linares at a distance using his jab. Um, let's see. There was a headbutt in the first round that caused a cut on the left side of Linares' uh, eyebrow. Uh, in the second round, Morales isn't following the script. Landed a big uppercut on Linares that shook Linares. And, it, you know, the, hey, man, you better come here and follow the script because, you know, but Morales wanted to bust that up. Morales wanted to upset the apple cart. In the third round, Linares started to close the distance and was landing nice body shots and just applying pressure with his jab. With seconds left in the third, let me tell you, oh my God, if you missed it. Linares threw a stiff jab to the body and he came up with a sharp right hand uh, that sent Morales to the canvas face first. 
face first, he fell to the canvas. Boom, from a sharp right hand that was set up from a jab to the body. Uh, Morales did beat the count, but when he got back in his corner, he was asking his corner man, what did I get hit with? He was out of it. He didn't know what he got hit with. Um, and, but I don't think they told him because it was over in the fourth with the same exact shot. So they couldn't have told him when he got hit with because Linares set the same shot up, jab to the body, right hand over the top, boom, lights out. It was over. Um, Len- <laughs> Linares beats and knocks out Morales for the first time in Morales' career. If you think Linares is washed up, think again. I think the jump to 140 was way too much, like I told you guys in the beginning. And at 35, he's back, and he's looking like a monster and just destroyed Morales. This is the same Morales that gave Ryan Garcia his toughest fight of his career, losing to Garcia by only majority decision. You guys cannot forget that fight. And I'm gonna, look, I'm going to tell you, we're going to come back to this to this uh, Jorge Linares. We're going to come back to this. If you guys did not see the main event, Ryan Garcia versus Francisco Fonseca. Ryan Garcia, 19-0. Uh, Francisco Fonseca, 25-2-2. and, two and two. Let me tell you, I thought this was going to be a tough fight because his only two losses came to the top. Uh, I'm talking about Francisco Fonseca here. Came to the top from the top guys. One of them was Tank Davis. It took Tank Davis eight rounds to get this guy out of here. And I don't know if it was like a real stoppage because he did hit Fonseca in the back of his head. And Fonseca went down, got counted out. But when this fight started with Ryan Garcia and Francisco Fonseca, I could tell off the rip that Ryan Garcia was very relaxed, poking his jab. He was, I mean, he just looked way more relaxed than any other fight. I think the combination between Canelo's coaches and him are really coming together because he looked, he looked like a vet, he looked like a, a good pro. To, he looked like a great pro tonight. Real relaxed. He wasn't jumpy. Picking his jab was touching with this uh, left hook he had. Fonseca went to go. Hit him with a right hand, and Ryan Garcia hit this man so hard with a step back, check left hook, and put him out in the first round, like in the first minute or so. And he was done, gone, finito, over with. Somebody should have called the Undertaker the way this man fell and hit his head on the back of the canvas. Something crucial. Ryan Garcia is the real deal let me tell you real deal he is and will be a super star of the sport if and only if he's moved right keep him the fuck away from jorge linares keep him away from jorge linares jorge linares is way too experienced and he showed tonight that he's not playing no games at 135. Way too experienced for King Ryan Garcia. He could be a superstar, but it's up to his promoters not to get greedy and try to push the kid too fast. Keep building him the way you're building him, and it's going to come. It's going to come, but I don't think he needs to be in the fight with Jorge Linares. Jorge Linares still has his speed, still has his counter shot ability, his counter punching ability, and that would just be bad for Ryan Garcia getting caught with one of those shots from uh, the veteran Lonares and just ruin the boy's career because he's on the pathway of becoming a superstar. Keep him there, keep growing him, keep letting the fans get it. He, you know, he sold out uh, wherever they were in Anaheim, wherever they were, um, with damn near all females. Keep growing him, keep building him, but keep him away from Jorge Linares. Matter of fact, keep Jorge Linares from any of your champions or any of your great prospects at that weight. Uh, Devin Haney did get in the ring after the fight. That that you know, to me, that's a that's a safer fight for Garcia. He has a better chance beating Devin Haney 
than fucking with Jorge Lenari is right now. But that's just my opinion. I'm not a promoter. We'll see what happens. Uh, but I, I guarantee you the fight strategies are switched up and Ryan Gar- Garcia will not be seeing Jorge Linares this year. I appreciate you guys tuning in for my fight recaps. I hope um, I hope they were helpful to you. I hope I did a great job. You guys let me know. Comment on whatever platform you're listening to. Comment on Facebook if you heard it there. Let me know how good of a job I did for you in recapping these fights. If you haven't seen them, go watch them. Uh, especially the Ryan Garcia knockout, man. It was just a phenomenal, sick knockout. You heard it here. That was your fight recap on The Zone and Showbox. I'm your host, Lamar Chanmaker Wright.